Welcome to the HPC Best Practices webinar series. This series is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, which is part of the XA Scale Computing Project of the US Department of Energy. The series is a collaboration involving the computing facilities at the Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Osni Marquez from Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and I'll be the host for today's webinar, Wrong Way. Lessons learned and possibilities for using the, in quotes, wrong programming approach on leadership computing facility systems. The webinar will be presented by Philip Roth. Philip leads the algorithms and uh, uh, performance analysis group at the National Center for Computational Sciences in Oak Ridge. He joined Oak Ridge in 2004 as a member of the Future Technologies Group and then moved to the National Center for Computational Sciences in 2018. His research interests include scalable techniques for performance optimization software characterization, program models targeting uh, program models targeting computer uh, computer accelerators, and also emerging technology. He's wearing a SC shirt today. He will be yeah. the general chair of SC24. <laughs> we have issued uh, issued more than 300 tickets for today's webinar, and all attendees have been muted. We'll be receiving questions through the uh, Zoom chat and also the Google Doc. Uh, I have pasted the address in the chat. The address is in the chat. I'll do it again in a minute. And we have asked Phil to, to add breaks during his presentation so he can uh, respond to the questions that come in. With that, Phil, I'll stop my sharing. And please. All right. Thank you for the introduction, Nozni. I believe you should be seeing my title slide. Yep. Okay. Um, so Avni did a, a very nice job of, of giving some background about me. Uh, this slide is, is basically uh, reiterating some of that. I'm not going to go through the, the first bullet because uh, he just um, talked about it. Um, I will hit on just two points because they're going to come in later. Um, one that uh, I, I did two separate stints in grad school, one at the University of Illinois um, and one at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, both were focused on performance uh, tools and, and techniques dealing with large scale HPC type uh, workloads. Uh, in between that, I was a software engineer for a startup company in West Central Wisconsin. Um, so I have a little bit of experience from, from try, trying to do this as a professional, although I won't claim to be a serious, serious software engineer. Um, all right, so where are we with respect to the Department of Energy landscape right now in, the, in terms of the, the uh, computing facilities? Um, the word that comes to my mind is variety. They, they epitomize variety. We have a variety of types of hardware um, in, in terms of accelerators, whether a system has them at all. Um, certainly in terms of the vendors, um, the, the different ratios of numbers of CPUs to GPUs, the connectivity within the node. Um, similarly, the interconnect, there's a variety of types of interconnects that, that we see on uh, DOE facility systems. Uh, also connectivity differences. Um, we have the question of non-volatile memory, whether it's on node or near node or not even present at all in a system. And that hardware um, in some ways drives also variety in the software, uh, but software is variety is also driven by things like community trends and, and user requirements. Um, where I work, the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility, it's a user facility. So when users come in and they have a particular uh, software stack that they care about to run on our summit system or, or soon to be our frontier system, um, we, we try to work with them to make sure that that's something that um, runs well on the systems that we have. And then there's also differences with respect to the types of projects that uh, a particular facility supports and the types of users um, that are working on those projects. So again, you know, I said uh, the word is, is uh, variety, but if I expand it a little bit, really the DOE centers are, um, are the poster children for performance, portability, and productivity, the P3 concept. So, because I work uh, in the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility, the bulk of what I'm going to talk about today is going to focus on systems here. And so um, if you're not familiar, um, the, the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility, OLCF, has um, one 
large production system right now, Summit. Um, it uses uh, Power9 CPUs and NVIDIA GPUs in it, each of its nodes. Um, soon, um, we will be fielding or making available Frontier, which is uh, x86 uh, 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 CPU processors from AMD, and then four um, AMD uh, Radeon Instinct um, MI250X GPUs per node. And then the, um, the interconnect on Frontier, the, the NICs will be directly connected to GPU memory. So we have a couple of support systems also. Um, they're listed here as pre-production and training. If you've taken a, a, a training event, a hackathon or, or something like that, um, uh, hosted by OLCF, you may have used the Ascent system, or uh, right now um, there's a Crusher hackathon going on. Crusher is a pre-frontier uh, pre system with the same hardware. Um, the, the key point I really want to bring out about this slide is that over 90% of the production system's computational capability comes from their GPUs. And in fact, it's over 95% for Frontier. Um, so I'm going to focus in this talk really on the GPUs and the functionality of GPUs, not as much maybe as, as the performance, but just essentially about, um, about making use of the GPUs. OK. Some of you may wonder um, about the title, and uh, I, I want to clarify what I mean by the, using the word wrong. So what do I mean? Uh, is it bad? Is it something that's discouraged or disallowed? Um, really, for the purposes of this presentation, what wrong means is it's not the usual or, or generally accepted way to program a GPU on a system. It's not necessarily something that's supported by the system vendors or the computing facility. So the, the real um, activity here is to try to think about what's possible, not necessarily what's, what's recommended. So perhaps I could have chosen something like off, off the beaten path instead of wrong way uh, for the terminology. But um, I hope everyone will, will uh, forgive the hyperbole and wrong. So I want to draw a little bit of analogy to, to try to um, clarify this notion of, of wrong. Um, I mentioned that I had done my PhD with um, Bart Miller at University of Wisconsin, and he has had a decades-long collaboration with Jeff Hollingsworth on a library that's called uh, Dynitz, dynamic instrumentation. So one of the things that Dynitz can do is that it can inject or remove code from a process while it's running. So for example, to, uh, for a tool to be able to insert or remove some instrumentation. Um, most tools like a performance tool will do that kind of instrumentation at compile time or even in source code um, before you even get to the compiler. Dynans lets you do it while the program is running. So this is really an alternative to way, the way that most people think about software, at least in my experience. They think that once it's compiled and I have an executable, that that, that executable code is all fixed and it really doesn't have to be. Um, is this, does that make Dynast wrong? Uh, is it a wrong way? No, um, it's just that uh, people need to think about compiled code as being a little more malleable than, um, than uh, what they may think. But it does require care, and I will return to that topic uh, later. Um, I, I will note, uh, just as a shameless plug for my former group, um, if you are familiar with the SPAC package manager, that uh, the, uh, it's one of the ECP fund, funded projects and very um, well adopted throughout the ECP, um, the ECP set of projects, um, Dynast is available via SPAC, and then there are several tools also in, in the, the, the uh, built-in repository for SPAC that, Dynast, uh, that use Dynast. So uh, with that, I'm going to stop and let uh, see if there are any questions. Not at this point. OK. So 
I want to make sure also that as I try to describe what is a natural way or a wrong way on various systems, I want to be a little more explicit. Um, so this slide is attempting to do that. Um, it's what determines whether a, an approach for programming GPUs is natural or, or the, the quote unquote wrong way is um, determined mainly by the type of the GPU and the source language. So um, don't take this slide as exhaustive lists, but it is listing some of the natural ways and some of the ways that I'm going to consider in this talk that are uh, uh, the non-natural non ways, the off the beaten path ways for each system. So I, I list three systems here, Summit, Frontier, those are both OLCS systems, and then Aurora is um, the system that will be deployed at, at uh, Argonne in their leadership computing facility. Um, I know less about the Aurora situation, so I'm going to be very cautious about what I have to say there. Um, and so yeah, I, I welcome someone from Argonne if, if, you, if I say something incorrectly to, to correct me. Um, so here at the top is showing a little bit about um, graphically what, um, what Summit would be considered natural ways in, in green. So CUDA, since it's NVIDIA uh, GPUs, CUDA would be a natural way, OpenMP offload, and then the OpenACC is, is supported. The ways that I'm going to talk about that are potentially wrong ways um, to program GPUs on Summit are the ones in gray, HIP, OpenCL, and, and Sickle, um, and DP, DPC++. Frontier has a similar list, but instead of, of CUDA, um, we have HIP as being a natural way and CUDA being not even an option. I'm not it's not even a wrong way. It's This is one where it's not even a possibility, to my knowledge. Um, and then Aurora, uh, again, I'm not sure that I have anywhere close to an exhaustive list here, but I do want to highlight in this talk, I will talk about a little bit about support for HIP. And please note, I, I consider a portability layer software, something like Cocos or Raja or Akka, to be uh, a natural approach as long as they have back-end support for at least one of these systems' natural approaches, and, and they do. So um, in, in at least for these three portability layers uh, software, that I consider them to be a natural approach for all of the systems. So I won't talk much about them in this talk. OK, um, the next part of this talk, I'm going to go into a couple of the programming models. It's organized by programming model. I'm going to start by talking about HIP. Um, HIP is, stands for the Heterogeneous Compute Interface for Portability. Um, it is a portability layer um, with an interface that's similar to CUDA and backends for AMD GPUs and NVIDIA GPUs. Um, and certainly on NVIDIA systems, um, it is a lightweight header only option. The final executable that you get if you compile on, on uh, 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 an NVIDIA for an NVIDIA GPU is a CUDA program. Um, and that's uh, graphically depicted over here in this slide I pulled from a, an earlier presentation I gave showing how you could start from CUDA code and use their Hippify um, uh, tool to uh, port the code over to be HIP code and then use the, in this case, it was the AMD um, uh, HIP compiler, HIP CC, whether you wanted to target uh, uh, NVIDIA GPUs or uh, AMD GPUs. Um, there are now more than one HIP compiler. Um, the AMD one is, is one that most people think of, but HPE's um, uh, CCE, com uh, Cray Compiler Collection, um, or Cray Compilers, has um, the ability to compile HIP code also. Um, there's a growing ecosystem of libraries for HIP. Uh, that will come up uh, a little bit later also. So HIP on Summit, um, a couple of years ago, I did some comparison uh, of trying to see whether there was any performance impact to uh, a HIP uh, program running on Summit versus a CUDA program that was doing roughly this, the same thing. So I took um, a benchmark suite that I'm somewhat familiar with, having, um, having helped develop it uh, maybe 10-ish 10, 10 years ago, um, called Shock, the scalable, scalable Heterogeneous Compute um, Benchmark Suite. 
and took the CUDA versions of the, the benchmarks and hippified them, and then measured the performance of both, compared the performance of both. Um, that This was done two-ish years ago, but um, I recently went back to uh, revisit those results, and that's what's showing on this slide. Um, in the early days, using HIP on Summit was really, really easy. All you had to do was clone the HIP repository. Um, it was available on GitHub. And then uh, add the, um, essentially point your compiler at the include directories and it would work. The current implementation is only a little bit more difficult to work with because it requires just a little bit of, um, of installation. It needs a, a header that has a version number in it and it gets that version number um, as part of the installation. So, but uh, OLCF is providing a HIP module now. Uh, essentially, it's uh, Rockham HIP is the name of the module. A module is, a, is some, essentially the way that we uh, manage our users' environments. Uh, they can load modules to make changes and, and get access to particular programs or libraries. So the upshot, though, of this updated data is, in fact, um, the, the message you should take from this graph is that the, the HIP versions are essentially um, at, at parity with the CUDA versions of these. And that's what we would expect because the benchmark um, or the, uh, the HIP versions really are at, dealt with as um, at compile time and you are running a CUDA program. So I wanna stop there and let uh, someone uh, see if there's questions. There is a... Uh... <laughs> A question here. I think it's, uh, are there right or wrong compilers? <laughs> ah, well, um, that's an interesting question. Um, there are certainly compilers that I, that in, in our case, the OLCF case that we are uh, going to support. But the one of the great things about open source software is that um, people can, in many cases, download and build their own if they want something that's, again, off the beaten path. I work on one project. Um, or work with one project that is uh, a project funded by ECP where some of the uh, developers are working in the Julia language. So they, they want to bring Julia compilers to these um, systems. And we are not OLCF. We don't have a, a Julia user base large enough that we're providing that for them. So um, I don't know that that particularly answers the, the question well, but... Um, the second one uh, I see in the chat, uh, uh, William, yes, uh, and I will touch on that. Uh, Peter um, is talking about Hipsicle. I will talk about that when I talk about um, Sickle in, in a little bit uh, later in the talk. Okay, I see some questions here in the Google Doc related to Dynast, but, you, but please continue, Phil. Phil. Okay, um, I, I had one, I see one that just came in about the, uh, the non-parity outliers. So it's a little Good. bit of a difficult to see what the benchmark names are here. Um, there are a few where um, I have not dug in. So the two that are, are a little bit lower here, um, as far as the hit performance are both from the same benchmark. Uh, it's an MD benchmark and I've not gone in and, and tried to uh, diagnose why those are a little bit different. Okay, so I mentioned that there's a, a growing number of, of libraries um, uh, that, that are HIP libraries that is to let you target both the um, AMD or NVIDIA GPUs. But I want to hit really hard this, this point that um, the ecosystem is, is very important. Almost any of the applications that are real applications running on these, these large scale systems rely on uh, one or more libraries, and we want them to be GPU accelerated libraries um, to make use of the, the capability of the system. So uh, as I mentioned before, um, the HIP ecosystem has this, this collection of libraries um, that can use either the AMD or NVIDIA backend that's shown in this layer diagram here, where, uh, for example, HIP blas is uh, the applications written to this uh, abstract Blas interface, and then underneath it can um, either be 
actually implementing the, the operations using Kublas or Rockblas, depending on which is the target GPU. So on the downside, uh, OLCF, to my knowledge, does not yet provide system-wide installations, even of HIPLAS. I, I don't see that on Summit. Um, so if you are wanting to do even uh, something as simple as that, that DGEM, that's it, part of the, the shock uh, benchmark suite, you have to build it yourself. I can give some guidance about how to do that. I'm not going to go into that level of detail in the talk, but uh, my, my email address is at the end, and I'm happy to tell someone uh, whatever they need to know to, to do that uh, if they'd like. Okay, so I, I mentioned I, I want to be very cautious about talking about Aurora, but I will say, uh, just because I'm involved in this project to, a, to some degree, um, there is a story here, and that's why I'm including it in this, this talk. Um, Aurora, it, OpenMP uh, uh, target offload and Sickle and DPC++ are the, the ways that um, are maybe more naturally thought of for programming GPUs that will be in Aurora. But remember that HIP is intended to be a portal portability layer. Um, this is the picture uh, for the default HIP implementation, um, CUDA and Rockham backends. There is a, a small ECP project called HIP, HIP LZ, HIP on level zero. It is, um, as a stated goal, of demonstrating that HIP applications can run on the Intel GPUs that will be in, in, uh, in Aurora. So level zero is the Intel runtime that, um, that actually lets GPU code run on their, their GPUs. Um, the original approach to this project was to take this other project called HIPCL, which is HIP implementation using an OpenCL runtime and porting it to use the level zero runtime instead of OpenCL. Um, and as part of this project, we've uh, demonstrated, uh, the project team members have demonstrated several of benchmarks and mini proxy apps running on um, the uh, Intel integrated GPUs on the pre-Aurora systems that they have um, uh, at Argon. Um, but note again the importance of the ecosystem. The one that I worked on this was this uh, mini app called Sparkler. Um, it's a mini app for uh, for a, a larger program called Comet. Um, we didn't have uh, it, it used uh, essentially Blas operations only two, but two was more than we had available. There was no uh, hip Blas. Um, and I didn't want to make it such that it directly called into MKL for those BLAS operations. So I built a stub hit BLAS library that uses MKL as a backend. So essentially taking that picture and adding a new backend to the hit BLAS um, is the, the, the stub approach. Okay, but this is not the end of the story. Um, more recently, the HIPCL and HIPLZ projects have combined their efforts in something called CHIPS. Uh, it's pronounced chip spear V. Um, essentially, that's what I'm trying to show over here on the right, that uh, there's this chip uh, spear V implementation that can um, live on top of an OpenCL or a level zero runtime, and that will allow it to run on uh, Aurora and several other systems. Um, it does depend on spear V as a, uh, as a portable intermediate language for the GPU code. And so uh, it is possible that uh, Summit and Crusher and Frontier could be uh, uh, potential targets using a open source um, OpenCL implementation called Pockle if it's got Spear V support. I'm going to pause there, see if there's, I see no new questions in the chat. There is a, there are a couple here in the Google Lock. One of them is about how to use SQL DPC++ from, from Fortran. <laughs> ah, OK. Yes. So um, the story uh, I mentioned earlier that, that uh, which approach that one uses is somewhat dependent on um, what their source code language is and what GPU that they're targeting. The story for Frontier, sadly, is, or sorry, for Fortran, sadly, is not particularly good uh, in terms of numbers of options. Um, directives seem to be the best supported approach, so like OpenMP offload. Um, but I have a colleague here at Oak Ridge, sits in the office uh, just behind me, 
that um, has also demonstrated a, a, a portability layer like Cocos that um, also makes it easier to call from Fortran. And that, uh, I don't have it in the slides. Um, perhaps I can send Osni a, an updated set of slides. That project is called YAKL, Y-A-K-L. Um, and uh, that might be of interest uh, just for the, the people that are interested in Fortran. And also because the, another question here, it's perhaps much more general, is, is Fortran or C++ the right way to program HPC machines? Uh, well, if you, I mean, if I'm honest, um, I don't know that I would say right or wrong there. I will say there's lots of factors that go into answering that question. It does feel like the, um, the first uh, approach or first, first best supported option is C++ right now. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of history. If you've got a legacy code that's uh, a, lar a large number of lines of, of Fortran, you may not care about what um, the compiler vendors are, are uh, providing for their first choice. Um, you may be just clamoring to have that Fortran. Please continue. Yeah, thanks. Okay, um, I'm gonna switch gears from HIP now and talk a little bit about a, a programming model that um, many people may have assumed is gone, uh, passed, um, but it, it, it's surfaced again for me recently for a couple of reasons, and I'll say why. Um, OpenCL is the, the uh, programming model. It's a chrono standard. Um, by some definitions of performance portability, it's one of the, the better options because there are a number of implementations and uh, they're by now fairly mature. Um, originally, it was mostly a C-based kernel language, but um, to kind of touch on that, that same question about C++ or Fortran, um, there have been recently some efforts to um, bring C++ features to OpenCL, and this is separate from Sickle. Um, so uh, I will note um, here, just because it's going to be relevant in a, in a second when I talk about Summit, that um, you can create the kernels that run on the GPUs, either by compiling the source code while, it's, uh, while the program's running. So that's uh, dynamic. Um, or you can take some, uh, you can ingest pre-compiled code. Um, that can either be the device native, at the actual executable code that would run on the, uh, the GPU, or um, some allow you to use some portable uh, intermediate representation like this Sphere V that I was uh, mentioning earlier. Um, and not all implementations support all options. Again, that'll become re uh, relevant in the next slide. Um, so what about on Summit? Um, Summit has, if, you, if you're if you familiar with OpenCL and want to use it on Summit, um, you might be poking around at various locations where you expect um, OpenCL files to be and uh, get excited because there are a few of them there, but you'll quickly find that it's an incomplete um, installation of OpenCL. Um, there are uh, essentially the device independent runtime library is uh, where you would expect it to be, um, but it doesn't have uh, uh, the necessary support for applications to actually use it, um, uh, to compile against it. Um, the NVIDIA driver installation adds uh, an execute, or uh, sorry, a, a library that um, is GPU specific, so specifically for the, um, for the GPUs in, uh, in Summit, but, um, the and I will say that CUDA installations on Summit have this device independent library and the headers, but it's um, it's not sufficient to actually use to build OpenCL programs. So the upshot is uh, on Summit, if you want to use OpenCL, you have to do a little bit of work. Um, I will note uh, that Nvidia, neither Nvidia nor OLCF ever claim to support OpenCL on Power9. Um, I, and I'm not trying to argue that, that either of those um, organizations should, but, um, but I think seeing what's possible is the reason why I'm, I'm giving the talk today. So what can you do if you want to use OpenCL? Um, it's, Kronos provides a reference implementation of their device independent runtime. And it's very much, um, 
it's it's very easy to uh, clone their repository from GitHub, and then essentially build that library, and then you can build applications that will use it. Um, in fact, if you are a, a user of SPAC, that package manager that I was mentioning, it has a, 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 the the package called OCL ICD, which is exactly this. Um, so you could do it manually, or you could do it through SPAC. Um, it's with that you can use the NVIDIA, um, that device specific library that I was mentioning that's there uh, on Summit. And you can actually demonstrate that you can do data transfers to and from the GPU and that you can uh, query the capabilities of the GPU. But it doesn't allow you to actually compile the source code uh, at runtime. So if that's a capability that you really want, um, there is an option. And I'm, I'm happy to say this slide is, is outdated as of this morning. Um, there's a, the, the portable computing language is an OpenCL implementation, open source. Um, it can use the CUDA runtime on Summit. And in theory, you can uh, build it to ingest Sphere V uh, kernels. So the, the part that's out of date on this slide, I, I say I've not yet demonstrated a working build on Summit. I have demonstrated that as of this morning, a working build of Pockle on Summit, um, but I have not yet verified the, um, that it can ingest Sphere V. Uh, so that's work yet to do. Okay. What about Crusher and Frontier. Crusher, again, is that pre-Frontier system that um, OLCF is fielding right now. Um, traditionally, AMD has provided uh, good support for OpenCL on its, um, uh, for its GPUs. Um, and uh, in fact, the OpenCL support is there on, on Crusher and will be on Frontier. Um, that at least to use the GPUs. I've not seen that it uh, out of the box lets you compile and run OpenCL code on, on the CPU. Um, well, I've also not yet seen uh, verified whether or not um, their OpenCL implementation can take Sphere V as a, uh, as a representation for kernels. I'm showing a few results on this slide. Again, it's for a limited number of those uh, shock benchmarks. Um, the numbers here are trying to compare the OpenCL performance normalized to the, the HIP performance of the of several shop benchmarks. And you'll see there's really two sides to the story. There's a, a left side where, for the most part, the performance of the OpenCL version is, is comparable, if not even uh, in some cases substantially better than um, the uh, performance that we see from the HIP version. This one that's substantially better is uh, uh, reading essentially a simple benchmark that uh, measures how the bandwidth for reading uh, from local memory. Uh, but there's also the right side of this chart, which is showing results um, taken from a, a gem, the, the, the gem benchmark in shock. Um, the HIP version calls HIP blahs to do its operation, its gem operation. And uh, HIPLAS is, uh, is optimized for the AMD GPU. The OpenCL version doesn't have that, um, that quite the same implementation. It's actually implementing the gem operation in OpenCL code. Um, and that's uh, the reason why I'm seeing it's not optimized. Um, that's why we're seeing that big discrepancy in performance for those. I didn't show all of the comparisons for all of the shock benchmarks here. There were too many uh, really extreme differences, both that were favoring the HIP version and that were favoring the OpenCL version to uh, make me really trust that they, they were um, actually representative of, of the actual difference between them. Okay. Is this using CL Blazer home roll gem? So, uh, it is a it was a home rolled gem. That's why the uh, the OpenCL version I think is is so much uh, less than the HIP performance. Sure. Other questions? No, I think we're good. All right. 
So somewhat like um, like uh, the OpenCL on on Crusher, on Crusher and Frontier, um, the story or the, at least the situation on on op of, for OpenCL on Aurora is promising, at least to me. Um, Intel's traditionally had good support for OpenCL, and they've been a champion of the the Spear V. Uh, use of Spear V. Um, their uh, one API programming, uh, I, I don't, don't know exactly what to call it, whether it's a, uh, you call it the implementation or, the, or uh, essentially it's a collection of, of programming technologies, um, includes support for um, interoperability between SICO code and OpenCL. And this is, uh, this is essentially a, 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 a understandable, um, in that uh, Sickle is really a, a spiritual successor to OpenCL. Um, and uh, it's also the case that the ALCF is including OpenCL in the, the public lists of the programming models that they plan to have available on Aurora. So um, again, OpenCL should be a, a well-supported option on, on that system. Are there Sickle implementations of the shock benchmarks? Um, I, I had taken a stab at that. I don't, like I said, I have not been an active developer of Shock for um, a good long while. Um, and so the, the original owner of the project was Jeff Vetter, who is, the, um, is a section head here at, at Oak Ridge in our computer science and math division. Um, he might know a little bit better what the current implementation, um, you know, current activities are in that project. Okay, so the last programming model that I want to hit on is um, is a, a combination actually Sickle and DPC plus plus. So Sickle, like OpenCL, is a Kronos standard. Um, it's C plus plus based. I think reflecting kind of the the community's direction or shift towards uh, mindshare towards uh, Open C or towards uh, C plus um, plus. Originally, it had a really strong uh, connection to Spear and now the Spear V uh, as an intermediate language. I, I don't know that that's um, the case for every Sickle implementation, but um, this was the way that it was for the Intel um, Sickle impl implementation. So DPC++ is... Uh, essentially Sickle version 1.2, but some added extensions that are designed to improve uh, productivity, make it a little bit easier to use. Um, and some of those extensions, you know, have turned out that way. They've been included in the Sickle 2020 standard. So what do you do if you'd like to try Sickle on Summit? Um, there are some options, and here's where uh, uh, there was a mention of, of Hipsicle in the chat, I think, earlier. Um, Hipsicle is definitely a, a, a usable option, and I've demonstrated um, simple examples there, like a, a large matrix AX plus Y operation. Um, and essentially, it's uh, using, uh, it can live on top of the CUDA runtime for programming the GPUs in Summit, um, and OpenMP uh, for running on uh, the CPU cores. Um, another option uh, for investigating Sickle on uh, Summit would be to take the, um, the Intel uh, LLVM staging repository, which has DPC++, an imp implementation of DPC++. I've tried this um, a while ago. Um, I found at the time that there was a uh, reliance on a, a x86 instruction called CPU ID that gets information about the processor that it's running on. Um, and that's not a, uh, that's an x86 specific uh, instruction. So it wasn't something that the Power 9 uh, could use. Um, but others had reported ha making some uh, success in getting around that for, for other um, non x86 64 platforms. In that case, it was ARM. Uh, so still not Power 9, but it was a non-X86 platform. So it may be possible, um, if not already, that the code base has been updated to work on, on Summit. I also tried a real convoluted, uh, ugly uh, attempt at a stunt of using um, uh, the community edition of uh, 
a compiler from a company called CodePlay that um, on an x86 system that I had with an NVIDIA GPU to compile kernels into uh, to a, a PTX code and then transfer that PTX code from that, that system over to Summit and try to load it um, via POCL, but I was not, was not successful with this big multi-system compilation uh, tool or workflow. Um, didn't, could never get that to work. So what about, that's a story on Summit, what about uh, Frontier? Um, I've really done less with this, but um, for an implementation that uh, is reliant on OpenCL as a runtime, um, for uh, which is is the case for some, um, the fact that AMD supports OpenCL well uh, is is a promising uh, option, right? It's something that's going to make it uh, more likely that this would be an approach that would work. But it may also not be. Um, there's another option in the works. Um, we are funding CodePlay to uh, implement a basic Sickle and DPC++ functionality um, for the uh, AMD GPUs. Um, and as I mentioned, there's the uh, Intel LVM uh, repository also, that those are two potential options. Um, but I, I want to hit again on that point to remember the importance of the ecosystem. We're finding in the project that's funding this, um, this uh, code play work that to get run real applications requires um, more libraries than we have available. And we're at the point of just demonstrating basic um, Sickle or, or DPC++ um, uh, functionality. OK, um, back to the. I should stop there and see whether there are more questions, because I'm I'm transitioning away from the uh, the programming model specific content. There is one here um, in the Google Doc. Both MPI CH and OpenMPI are CUD aware. Uh, are there people out there working on OpenCL, HIP, and SQL aware MPI? Ah, uh, that's a that's a very good question. Not it's not one that I have any information on. So I would hesitate to say yes or no. Uh, certainly can't say yes, but I, I don't want to say no because I, I have not heard of such a thing, but. Um, and there is one that just came in in the chat, if you can. Yeah. Experience with accelerating the uh, OpenMP target. Well, we have, I, I think there are, uh, we have it within the facility here. Uh, I, I, I will confess, uh, I am not a huge fan of directives, and if I have to write code myself. I tend to lean on things like Cocos. Um, we do have instances of people that are relying on OpenMP target um, for their application. Um, and so if I so okay, so uh, if you have a specific Michael, if you have a specific question about OpenMP target or a specific system, I might be able to be a little more uh, specific about an answer. But um, and then this follow on was how about ISO C++ parallel versus Sickle? Um, you know, there are some implementations of, of uh, C++ parallel that are getting, uh, getting out there in the wild. I've not done a performance comparison between that and, um, and Sickle at this point. Yeah, go ahead then. Please. All right. Thank so uh, I, I want to go back to this notion of general notion of wrongness and get back to my analogy where I was talking about dynas. I mentioned that choosing this off the beaten path approach uh, requires some care. Um, so in the case of that dynance library, um, it, if you can imagine it, the library has to, the library writers have to know a, a heck of a lot about the CPU architecture uh, the compiler and what kinds of code generation that it can do uh, so that they can recognize and uh, do an analysis of an, a binary executable to know what's safe to uh, change while the program's running. That compiler knowledge, um, well, it's, uh, there's also operating system uh, issues um, or dependencies. 
there are so many combinations among all of the, the those three aspects um, that it, it was a lot of work, has been a lot of work for, for that project to continue to try to stay on top of things, especially over time as, for example, new versions of a compiler come out or um, a compiler maybe gets optimized or uh, it changes the way that it does optimizations um, to things that the Dynitz library doesn't necessarily support or didn't. Um, so essentially, I, I want to just emphasize that taking one of these off the beaten pathways comes at a cost. You potentially are setting yourself up for not having support from either the, the facility or the, um, or the vendor. Um, it can be uh, can be difficult. So I strongly advise, I know I, I kind of have so far talked about a bunch of things that potentially are not good choices to do, but possible. I do wanna say what I do recommend, which is um, really be careful about thinking uh, what you and your project are willing to devote over time to adopt one of these off the beaten track uh, approaches. So several of the factors that uh, I think you should consider are in this um, are in this slide: the performance impact, um, the portability of the approach. We're thinking about what systems you want to target now, and it, at least in the known future, um, maintainability. Uh, how difficult will it be if you have to be the one that's providing support for a particular? Uh, tool or tool chain or library on a, on a system. And then also, if you have an existing code base, the cost of doing the conversion to something different. Um, this is not necessarily related uh, directly to the whole idea of a wrong way approach, but um, I just think back to a project I was uh, uh, involved with where uh, we were considering whether to adopt a, a new uh, programming approach and uh, the question became, could we do it incrementally? Could we have some series of decision points to say uh, it's, you know, okay, it's turning out well, or we didn't have to necessarily uh, convert the entire uh, application to use this new programming approach uh, all in one fell swoop. Uh, so, and here's, you know, probably the most controversial thing I'm gonna say today. Um, I think in general, our community doesn't yet have the tools or the discipline to do a real quantitative uh, cost to benefit um, comparison to answer these questions. Um, but it may, you know, I, I list a couple of follow up questions here. Maybe, maybe we don't need to have a real quantitative benefit and cost. Uh, analysis before we make the, the decision. So that's something I'd like to hear other people's um, opinions on too. Um, and then finally, uh, I'm involved in a project where a, a person right now is very um, hesitant to adopt GPUs um, because they're expecting that there should be something like MPI, that's a near ubiquitous standard approach that are, is well supported and everyone should be using that. Um, as, as much as that would be nice, it's not the world that we're in right now and won't be for the next at least near term future. So um, don't let the lack of something uh, ubiquitous be the thing that keeps you from uh, tar uh, trying to target GPUs. Okay, um, the, the work that I have been doing on this is supported both by ECP and uses the um, facilities at the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility. Um, I'm gonna summarize, if you pull my slides, um, you will see there are um, also a couple of extra slides with references. So um, there will uh, in that slide deck be a few, uh, few more that if you want to, get more information about a particular piece of software that I talked about, um, you can look at that reference thing. So really, uh, just to summarize, really a lot of what I've been doing in this investigation is, um, is coming at the, 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 from the power of open source projects, right? The, the fact that I, I could go and actually just download a, a GitHub repository, um, 
to uh, go build a new compiler and try it out, try to figure out whether something could work on, on uh, for example, on Summit. Um, it, it, it certainly not possible in a completely closed source world. So, um, so I think that that's that's a, a key um, capability that's enabled by open source. Um, the work that I'm doing with this really, again, is just to try to figure out what is possible, not necessarily what's going to be rec recommended. Um, and I, I just want to hit one more time on those uh, having multiple considerations that uh, one should think about when they're uh, considering the cost of uh, adopting one of these wrong ways. So uh, there is. There is a comment and a question there again. Yeah. There seems to be a tension between the lack of ubiquitous standard and having a limited support for architectures. Yes, um, I, I agree with the statement. Um, and I, I think over time, there will be some coalescing of, of at least approaches. Um, you know, I think we had a question in the chat earlier about um, uh, essentially parallel standard C++ and versus Sickle. I think there are efforts uh, among the Sickle community to get some of the, the concepts at least to be um, standardized, brought into the ISO standard. Um, I think Cocos has had uh, um, an in instance of having one of their concepts brought into uh, a C++ standard. So I think these C++ based approaches trying to standardize things uh, is at least happening to a degree, but we're not there yet, certainly. Um, what about reproducibility? Scientists need to be able to reproduce analysis on specific software versions and options. Okay, um, so that's an interesting point. Um, and uh, I, I can think of multiple ways that one might try to uh, ensure that. Um, one thing that Oak Ridge is, I, I would argue, is not leading the way on, uh, but we are starting to get support for, is the use of containers on our HPC platforms. Um, if you log into Crusher right now, um, and, and also our precursor to Crusher was named Spock, um, you can run a containerized uh, HPC application on the system. And that's not been the case on OCS systems in the past. I think NERSC uh, has had support for running with containers uh, for a long time, uh, and they have pretty active, I know Shane Cannon has been very active there um, in terms of, of trying to provide that support. And why would this, if you're not familiar with containers, they, they let you essentially freeze a collection of, of uh, so software, essentially the application and libraries uh, into an image, and then that uh, image would be your way of tracking um, so that you could reproduce it or take it to different um, systems, but not necessarily have to change um, version numbers or whatever. Um, Osni, are there other questions in the... Uh... No, I think we are fine there. What I'm going to do, I'm going to later take all these questions from the chat, paste them into the chat in the Google Doc, and I'll ask you to go through and... Uh, and uh, you know, revise the sanitize, clean a little bit the the, okay. the, the others. So uh, what I'd like to do now, Phil, since we have some time left, so participants can unmute themselves. So I suggest, the, you know, participants that like to ask questions directly to you so that they, you know, they can do so by mute, muting and uh, any questions from the audience. So we can ask directly to Phil, if you'd like. Let's see here, I'm looking. Questions from the uh, participants? Phil, at the very beginning, if while people think, at the very beginning, going back to the Google Doc here, there's one. Does anyone know whether there is a development for OpenACC on Intel level zero? Ah, on level zero. Um, yeah. And it, it continues for comparison for NVIDIA GPUs, one can use NVIDIA HPC 
uh, it's possible to run open ACC on AMD GPUs with the GCC version, uh, you know, 10 and later. Right. If, if configured properly. Right. And that, that was where my thought initially went to um, the fact that GCC had has that support um, for open ACC. Um, and in fact, for our frontier system, we'll, we'll be relying on that uh, support. I know also HPE is um, said that they're going to support open ACC now in their uh, compilers for, for frontier also. Um, but I don't know about over level zero. Um, what I wonder is whether there wouldn't be uh, whether it wouldn't be more likely at this point for finding some implementation that uses an OpenCL runway or uh, runtime. There's a question here from Carl um, in the chat. Do you, do you see it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so watch for updates on right way, uh, meaning which ways are supported by the. Um, by the facility or the vendors. I would argue that one of the good ways to do that would be to um, participate in, in the training events that your facility, you know, your, whichever one you're interested in put, puts on. Um, I think about like uh, right now on uh, this Crusher pre-Frontier system where we had hackathons last week and this week for um, for different application projects, it was a limited set of people that um, are able to get access to that. I recognize that, but we also do training events for, um, you know, Summit. Um, our user meeting, it's annual meeting. Um, that's another place to get the information where uh, really we would talk about what are the, the, the best practices, right, best approaches for targeting the system. And I know every facility has similar activities that they do. We're going back in the chat here. We may have skipped that qu qu question. Have you tested Magma on Cursor Frontier? So uh, I do. So I have not done benchmarking. But I have a postdoc that has done some benchmarking of Magma on um, uh, as part of our work with uh, trying to bring some uh, ECP application projects to uh, run well on uh, on Crusher and eventually Frontier. Um, I can't say much more about that um, in this context, um, unless there was a specific question I, that I might be able to be more specific about. But I, I, I don't want to speculate on you know what the intent of the question was. Uh, any other questions from from the participants? There is one participant participant typing right now, so let's see for the question. Uh, okay, so why has not anyone worked on something like write once, run everywhere for in quotes for GPUs? <laughs> uh, well, I think I I wonder in you know that that question really is whether it's about a little bit about human nature. Um, so I think there's people have different reasons for having. Uh, preferred different approaches, right? Some of it's kind of imposed upon us, um, either by the source code language or, or by the, the particular type of GPU or whatever. Um, if you don't have any support for a particular thing and you really don't want to get into the business of being the one who has to provide it and support it, then you're, you're beholden to whatever is, is actually out there and available. Um, but it's also the case that, for example, if I were a developer of, of portability software X, and uh, you're the developer of portability software Y, and we have slightly different, maybe some similar concepts, but different implementations. We may be able to do that uh, hip CL, hip LZ, let's get together and, and, uh, and leverage each other's work. But we may also be saying for a, a bunch of non-technical reasons, I want my approach to succeed. Um, and I think one of the interesting discussions it, talking about or thinking about how you do this cost benefit ratio analysis is whether, uh, whether you can get past the, okay, I'm gonna give up on, on some of the things that I really think are important so that we could maybe as a combined project make better um, progress overall. All right, so good. I don't see any further questions. We have one minute left. Uh, I'll just quickly 
if you'll take back here uh, the sharing. Yes. And I will, uh, I'd like to thank you very much, Phil. I think it was a very, lots of interesting information here. Thank you all the participants for joining us today. Uh, these slides are already available. Uh, I paste the link in the chat and here we have the link again. Uh, so the uh, recording will be available soon. Uh, will be for people who signed up for the, uh, for the webinar will be received the coordinates to the recording by email. And the next webinar in the series is about even a less than a month from today. Software design patterns in research software with examples show open form. And that's going to be presented by Tomislav Marek from Technical University of Darmstadt in Germany. And we have already the website ready there for. Um... OK, so let's see here. I think that we have a bunch of people saying thank you to you. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for your attention, everyone. Yes, thank you. Thank you again, Phil. Yep. All right, take care. Yeah, you too. I'll get back to you soon. Yes.